uh, for the 21 to 20, 2022 to 2023 academic year. Um, we are very excited to host tonight's session with current trainees to answer some questions about choosing a program and navigating the wait list. Thank you so much for starting the recording. Um, I would like to have some of our panelists go around and introduce themselves, including their current institutions. Um, so I'm just gonna call on you guys by name. So first, can we have Jay introduce yourself? Hi guys, yeah, uh, nice, nice to meet everyone here. My name is Jay. I'm a first year MDP student here at McGill in Canada, in Montreal. And then Gina. Hi everyone. Um, I'm a first year student at um, UPenn and I applied like last cycle. To the panelists, thank you so much for being here. We're so grateful you took the time out of your day to come virtually to our meeting um, and share how you each chose your respective programs. Uh, my name is Lisa Horowitz and I'll be your moderator for this evening. I'm a first year MD PhD student at University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, and the chat box helping us moderate will be Min and our volunteer live tweeting the event will be Jethin. So for those of you who are going to step away or miss a piece of this event, we will have it recorded. And as the moderator, I'll remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. And we have already received those submitted during the registration process. We have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes collecting questions live so you can submit the questions in the chat box at any time now. I think that's all the announcements, announcements that I have. So thank you again for all being here. And I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. I guess the first question I have here is um, access to the Zoom link, but if there are any other questions. Hey, Alyssa, the question should be on the moderator document. Are they not there? Hmm. I don't think I see them actually, but give me one second. There's still also in the chat box, uh, Q and A uh, box, also at least. Got oh, it. Okay. Okay. I think there's like two links. Like one is what Min posted in the chat, but also in the Q and A. There's actually a question by Catherine. If you want us to cover that. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So Catherine's asking, what are some examples of interview questions specific to MDPG programs? Um, Gina, would you like to start? I can go afterwards. Yeah, sure. I think the the biggest thing will be talking about your research. Like, um, I would make sure you're really comfortable like answering a general, like, tell me about your research type question. And then you would probably talk about your most significant research project. Um, I would really focus on highlighting how you were independent in that project and maybe how you were able to um, propose new ideas to the project or show some sort of research independence, since I think that's a big thing that a lot of programs will look for. Um, other than that, I think the YDM, YMD PhD question is pretty common too. I think I got that one a few times on interviews. Um, so kind of explaining why you wanted MD PhD and also maybe touching on why not just an MD or why not just a PhD, because obviously obviously it's a long career path. And I think um, admissions just wants to make sure you understand the path that you're undertaking and you have like really good motivations and reasons um, behind um, pursuing an MD, PhD specifically, as opposed to doing research as an MD only or things like that. Um, so those would be, I would say, the top two that come up in many interviews for me. Yeah, for myself, obviously, we can't go too much in, into specifics about the actual question themselves, but, um, you know, like, YMDPH is a very, very common one. What's also unique and important to, to like, know and to kind of have some, have some introspection on is 
you know, why the MD and PhD, right? Like a lot of a lot of questions sometimes will ask you in terms of why don't you do them separately, right? Like because of the fact that when you're a medical student, when you attach a PhD on top of that, you are, as you know, mentioned, taking a huge commitment. Uh, you're taking an additional like four years usually, right, to do a PhD. And sometimes even then, uh, a normal PhD is maybe about six years. So you're on time crunch. You really have to know and get started in terms of what you want to do and be very objective with it. So another quite a lot of questions will be geared towards things like, like do you know your, your research well? Like, you know, on your MCAS applications or, um, and I, I mean, in this case for us, it's Minerva and OMSAS in Canada here, but it's not just about what you did. It's about what you got out of it, right? And we and we really want to see, like looking back at my application and, and the way I performed and how the, what the feedback that I received was that they really enjoyed people that were really able to um, reflect and um, communicate what they got out of the experience, not so much, oh, I got, you know, 10,001 publications out of it and that's it, right? Like, what does it mean to you ultimately? So, yeah. Thank you guys so much for answering that. Um, so since we are talking a little bit about um, choosing your school right now, and I know we're getting close to that decision deadline, um, I guess there's a question, how likely is that that someone will get accepted off of at least one of four wait lists? And what is your experience with that? Maybe you can add. I can go at first. Um, so, the, I, so, 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 just, just to clarify, it's a question um, asking the wait, like how, what the chances are of a wait list. Well, you know, if you see a lot of like online things where like oh, like one acceptance or one A equals like three interviews or whatever, I don't really believe in that. Um, to kind of debunk some things it honestly it's very it's really variable as a lot of applicants every year um for me i also did apply in the states so i understand the whole primary application process and all the secondaries and all that kind of stuff and from my previous experience um because i was in, i was also applying as an international student i was a bit limited in terms of work and apply uh, a lot of them were at prestigious schools like what well, upenn for example where gina's at um but for me I, a lot of them, I was actually waitlisted, but then afterwards, I, I think the uh, letters of update was also something that helped a lot, um, depending on the schools. And eventually, like for my probability, well, in terms of the denominator being the number of waitlists and the denominator being the number of sentences, sentences was probably like, I want to say like 70%. So if it's one in four, I, I think you, sh you can be optimistic, but that's based on my own experience. Yeah. Yeah, I would um, similarly say it, it just varies a lot, um, both school to school and just year to year. Like, I think I had schools where I was put on the wait list and I like withdrew my name because I, I didn't think I'd have a good chance of getting off the wait list. And then I hear they accepted like, you know, like four or five students off the wait list that year. So it, you know, it can, it can just vary a lot. Um, but I think if you do have like several wait list options, I think um, if you are like, um, like Jay said, making sure you show your intent, so you're like writing a letter of intent or a letter of interest for the schools that you're really excited about. Um, I think that can have a big impact as well as just keeping in contact with the admissions team, like letting them know that you're like, you know, seriously considering the school and you would love updates, um, they might even be able to be willing to give you a little more insight into like when they think they'll um, see some movement on the wait list, things like that. Um, so really just continuing those um, relationships you made with the admissions um, people, the people running admissions during your interview process, um, those can help you kind of um, deal with some of the variability um, in the wait list um, situation. I know it's it's very difficult and very stressful being on like four wait lists um, to this person. So, um, you know, keep um, keep doing what you can, but again, it can, it can vary a lot. And I understand that's very stressful. On that note, I think there's also a question, will updating schools about an accepted publication make a significant difference or any chance to get off the wait list? And then maybe, Along those lines, um, even if someone has a publication and process, I guess, what would you recommend they do um, in communicating with admission? I can start again. Oh, Gina, go ahead. Oh, no, you can go. So this is actually really relatable. It actually happened to me during the cycle. I think 
I, cause I, you know, interviews are, are, it's like, it's like the biggest peak is around from like, I want to say like fall to like early winterish, right. And afterwards things kind of start to go down. And I remember I, I sent a letter of update, um, around February, I want to say, um, and I actually did get a publication. It was into a pretty good journal. Um, so I think that helped a lot. Um, but you know, it really, it, honestly, I, it, when it comes to that, uh in your letter of update if you do have a publication and if it's if it's been accepted you can say like like accepted maybe like pending like publication pending like sometimes some people I, honestly one thing for sure is that if don't don't update people if it's like submitted or like you know pending revision or something it, it has to be something like oh accepted pending revision or something like that you know it, it's I, I i personally from what i what i got the, the feedback that i got um, it was a lot better um, when it was more accepted than, for example, under revision or it's been submitted. Um, and so, yeah, that's what that's what I would say. Yeah, I would I would recommend sending that in. I think that's a exciting update. Um, I think even if you don't have like a specific update, I think it's still worth sending a letter at this point and like expressing your interests. Um, but I, I think having the publication is obviously like huge. So you, you definitely want to update them on that and make sure, um, yeah, the school knows that one, you're thinking of them and two, that you are continuing to grow and like continue to develop as a scientist. I think they would find that really exciting. So um, I wouldn't say it's like 100% going to get you off the wait list, but it can only help. So definitely worth submitting. One other thing as well with the letter, guys, is that if you do get a, if you get a publication accepted, um, also what I what what helped me out a lot is um, write about like maybe like what you did and what that meant to you as well, and not just say oh I got a publication to like this journal with an impact factor like X Y and Z, right? Like talk about what that meant to you as well. So, yeah, I think that was a really important point, um, and I think there are a couple of questions about just applying MD-PhD. So I think people are really curious about that. So we have one question that is, how did you allocate your stories or experiences among the YMD, YMD-PhD and significant research essays? It, and is some overlap in those stories okay? Yeah, I can, I can start. I remembered I struggled with finding that distinction too when I was applying. Um, I, I definitely had some overlap, um, but I tried to find ways to make sure each um, each um, essay that we had to write was very distinct. I think for me, the most like unique one is the um, research experiences one, since that one's a little, you have a lot more um, words, you have a lot more space, so you can really go into depth about some of your research, some of like what you did, um, what you learned from it. Um, so be um, more specific and kind of um, give a lot more of like your research expertise. Um, the other ones I would focus more on, um, you know, telling a narrative and conveying your interests and your motivations for pursuing an MD and, and an MD PhD. Um, for me, that was a lot of overlap because my reasons for pursuing an MD are like very really heavily based in research. Um, so it's totally fine to talk about some research in your um, MD um, essay, um, but make sure you're also talking about like more specific things that are slightly more clinical um, in that essay. And then for the MD-PhD one, I tried to focus more on, you know, why doing both was really important to me and then focus on like some of the interactions I've had with like MD-PhDs that made me like know that this was the right career for me. Um, so that's kind of how I differentiated them, but it's, it's okay if there is overlap. Um, just make sure you're telling like kind of different stories and that each essay gives like a different angle of your interests in, in medicine and science. Yeah, um, that's a great answer. And for myself, um, so my background, I'm actually a literature major in undergrad. So I like to do a lot of story times, right? So I remember I made MD, YMD, YMD, PhD, and I significant research essays to be like distinct themes, but also how they connect to one another, right? Like I assumed that they read the YMD first and then the MD PhD and then the significant research, research essays, whatever. So what I did was that for YMD, you know, everyone has their own story, right? Like for me, for example, I learned English when I was 16. So learning how to communicate, learning how to talk and connect with others was something that meant a lot to me with my patients. And that's something that I advocated for. So that was like my, my YMD. 
And then in my YMD PhDs, when I talk about, oh, how does, you know, basic science or translational science, how does that affect patient care today? And how does that connect to my reason to advocate for patients, right? And so that, so that kind of transition made it, I guess, smoother and perhaps did help in terms of not just for the, for the interviewer, but also for myself when it came to drafting a lot of these um, personal statements. And then for the significant research essays, um, within the YMD PhDs, when I kind of outlined some of my points and some of the things I want to talk about and elaborate on for the research essays, I remember the significant research essays were like the word limit was pretty big. So after I kind of um, put some, some of my themes down from the YMD PhD is when I elaborated on each of them within like paragraphs by paragraphs of paragraphs. And one thing, one thing also with the significant, significant research essays that I did um, that perhaps could be helpful for you guys is to put a lot of numbers down, right? Like, oh, I did X, Y, and Z for this amount of time, uh, helping out with 13 plus like conferences, like whatever drafting, like, like that's when you're supposed to kind of impress um, your your research experience in terms of how that, how what kind of impact you've made and what that impact have done uh, you, and what kind of things you want to do with the impact that you have created. So uh, yeah, sorry if I rambled on there, but hopefully that made sense, yeah. <laughs> No, that's okay. So you talked a little bit about the interview process and how you were thinking about answering those questions and what questions would come up. So someone is wondering, what are some examples of those interview questions that are specific to MD-PhD programs? Was this the same question from earlier? Where like, is it asking about yeah, so this is just asking about the interview process a little bit less about um, just the like accepting your like place in medical school. Okay, so my hours, I, I mean, I can maybe Gina can talk about the US and I, I can make myself more in terms of the Canadian interviews here for MD PhD. Uh, for us here in uh, in the in the north, <laughs> uh, we basically um, like so we did like a, you know, like a normal, you know, traditional interview, right? But afterwards, we were actually told to present for about ten minutes, just about uh, about us, about uh, about like about us, and then about our research experience. And afterwards, we'd be grilled for about 15, 20 minutes on our research. And so it's like almost like a it's like your own like thesis, thesis like graduate defense, where like they grill you until you ask until you admit that I don't know, but that's something I want to pursue, right? Um, so that was very intense. It was very interesting, but yeah, um, I guess. They kind of liked me based on how I did. So, <laughs> yeah, for me, I would say um, there's like a few different like styles of interviews you'll encounter um, and within those different types of questions. So, you, you, there's some schools where you will have like traditional MD interviews where you will go through the like same um, ad, like admissions process as the MD students. So, you'll have very typical like MD interview questions if it's like um what MMI or like normal like traditional interview either one of those um and then in addition schools will either have like kind of a combined MD PhD um interview some of those might be like with a um um like interviewed by like a panel kind of like what Jay said where you'll have like multiple um like professors or like people on the committee asking you questions um, or it might be just like one person from like an admissions committee who's there to ask you questions about like MD PhD specifically. Um, and then you might also um, have interviews with like PhD faculty, or they might be MD PhD too, but um, people who are primarily doing research. Um, and those are really focusing on your um, research questions in particular and talking about your experiences in research. Um, and also like an opportunity for you to ask those researchers questions, to kind of see how you interact with people, um, different PIs and people who do research regularly. So I would say those are kind of like the three broad categories that I saw. And so within that, you might see different questions, some focus more on like your motivations for like medicine and going kind of along a spectrum. So I'm asking more like more motivations and research and what your research interests are and what your experiences are. Um, and then kind of combining those for the like MD, PhD kind of interviews where you're like using those experiences to reflect on um, why you want to do an MD, PhD. Um, so that's kind of a, a broad overview of what, what you may encounter during interviews. I guess if you guys don't mind answering, what is your current or hypothetical research focus if you haven't chosen one yet? Um, is it interdisciplinary with clinical medicine and how so?
I can start. I mean, Gio, do you want to start? Or I feel like I'm always starting things out. <laughs> um, okay, so for me, uh, I have a really big background in cardiology and atherosclerosis. Um, a lot of my, so I did, I did a couple gap years, did a master's and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, I, and I looked at this one protein called PCSK9 in terms of its ability to regulate LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol in your blood for about like seven years, both in the clinic, but also in the wet lab. So that's like my why for MD-PhD. And so, and that was back uh, in Toronto, which is where I'm from. And now that I moved even further away from you guys in uh, uh, up the North in Montreal, um, I'm, con I'm, I'm actually continuing to work within that field. Actually, uh, my supervisor would be the guy who actually discovered PCSK9 back a couple of years ago. Um, on atherosclerosis, looking at plaque instability, thrombosis, you know, things that clinically cause, uh, cause a STEMI, right? Uh, sorry, a heart attack. So um, uh, the point is that for me, I, 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 my, my, my background is very, very basic science, very fundamental science. And, you know, my PI has been telling me, hey, you know, you can be a doctor one day, right? So there, so she was like, so I was like, yeah, I guess so. And she was like, okay, then you also have to get a view of what, what translational science is like, you know, what clinical research, research is also about as well. So on top of doing basic science, PCSK9 research, I'll also be doing more of a hybrid um, for atherosclerosis um, within the context of clinical and also basic science. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm um, still like um, in my first year, so like I haven't fully decided on like what my thesis is going to be or anything like that. Um, but generally, I um, came in really interested in um, sort of microbiology and immunology. I um, took two gap years and I worked um, in a lab study in microbacterium tuberculosis um, in like a mouse model for that, that um, focused on like how to recapitulate latency in mice. So it was like pretty basic science. Um, I didn't really like interact or do much translational stuff or like work with patient samples at all. Um, but I had done some of that in the past. Um, so looking to, um, you know, my thesis, I think I'm looking to maybe do a project that kind of has, maybe have multiple projects that, or kind of related projects that have maybe some sort of translational element. Um, but also have like a basic science component. I think especially for my my PhD, I, I kind of want to focus on a basic science component so I can think about um, sort of basic science questions and how to like formulate hypotheses and things like that. Um, and then kind of maybe do more translational work later on. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely figure out that, that balance as I go along. But yeah, something within sort of microbiology, immunology, and infectious disease, especially bacteria and microbiome is what I'm hoping to go into. Thanks for sharing. I guess, so there is one question. I'm not sure if you guys will be able to answer this one, uh, but to your knowledge, do you know about any MD-PhD social science programs? Do you have any friends with experience that were looking into these programs? Um, or do you know if your institutions have these programs? Yeah, I know um, Penn has some like social sciences. So um, we have like anthropology um, as well as I think history of science. Um, you can do even like economics, I think, um, and a few others. Um, I think I don't, I can't, I won't try and name the one specifically that like in my interview process, I, I saw that um, had social sciences, but I, I'm sure there's like a list online or like resources where you can find like the ones that do have social sciences, um, Penn's one of them. And I only like speak from my experience. Um, but yeah, it tends to be sort of like, um, there's fewer people who do social sciences, but um, they're really valued in our class. Like it's great to have those like perspectives, um, people who do um, different things than like what lab research. So um, yeah, love our um, MD, PhD social science people. Yeah, likewise, I think I do agree with that, where um, a bigger, the bigger portion of, of the MD-PhD class tend to be more science-based. However, we do have a select few people who are doing social sciences. Like, for example, in Quebec here in uh, Montreal, we have a very, very big uh, Francophone population, you know, those who speak pure French. And um, we, as one person, for, for example, looking at, number one, the epidemiology, another person looking at, for example, the socioeconomic factors that determine um, you know, disparities between the Francophone population with the rest of Canada who are mostly Anglophone. Um, so seeing difference like that, seeing in terms of healthcare access, 
especially with the hot topic of COVID-19 and how that basically changed you know, all parts of our lives altogether, especially with healthcare access and how unready we are in terms of when we first hit, got hit with the pandemic three years ago. So um, a lot of research um, is uh, dedicated towards it actually within our joint program. The only, the only thing for us that I can't answer is that I don't know how much of that PhD has been committed towards that one subject. Because as you may know, in our, in our PhDs, we have multiple chapters and I just don't know how much of that they could fulfill. I have no idea. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you, um, you being able to answer that. I, I was not expecting such a complete answer. That's amazing. Um, and then I guess I don't see any other questions in the chat or any other pre-submitted questions, but I do want to ask you guys, um, what is the best advice that you think you could provide to your former self when you were in this situation, like mid-March, um, maybe you knew where you were going, maybe you didn't. Um, what is something that you would have wanted to know? Is this like philosophical or is this supposed to be like one ingrained fact about, hey, 89% of people get into this like, or? <laughs> I mean, if that would have helped you, then maybe <laughs> that fact is important. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, for me, I mean, especially now that we're late in the cycle where we're waiting for things, then applying and writing for things, right? And I can completely understand a whole anxiety and oh, where will like where, where will I be going next year? Or uh, I, I can understand that. I, I actually went through like I think like two or three MCAS cycles before I got something solid, right? So I can empathize. But one thing, if I were to tell myself two or th you know two or three times within two or three years ago, um, was definitely to trust yourself right? Like, uh, it's so like vague and whatever, but basically, you know, when it, the imposter syndrome that you might get when you, when you really have, after you get over being happy over getting an interview invite or, you know, oh, did, did they, you know, you know, when you get the interview invitation email and you're like, oh, was that really for me? Was that, it's, it's mine now, right? You, you can't take it back, right? Like that imposter, imposter syndrome and the nervousness you get, oh, like, I don't know if I'll do well right before the interview, uh, that kind of feeling and just waiting for, the results that come out and be like, oh, I feel like the the longer time has gone on, the worse I did. In all those little and big moments, um, I would have told myself and maybe to you guys to really trust yourself, right? Like, especially uh, once you're in the MD PhD program, the imposter syndrome, at least for me, didn't get any better. Uh, and number two, uh, at the same time, um, you know, there's a reason why you were chosen for X, X or Y, right? And just know that you can do like you can you can do it. Like you can really, really do it. It's just a matter of trusting yourself because a lot of us, we tend to be like, wow, you know, when we achieve something, we kind of forget to be kind of proud of ourselves and like acknowledge that achievement. We're we're always just like, hey, what's next? What's next? What's next? Right. Especially those who apply or those who are interested in the NDPC program, a lot of us are very, very ambitious. So just having to kind of just take a moment and be like, hey, I am so proud of myself. And I'm really, really glad of how far I've come up to this stage. Um, it's something I would have told myself back then. So, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I agree. Um, take a second to like congratulate yourself. Take a deep breath. Like you made it through the process, which is like super grueling. So um, a big congrats for that. Um, and then um, the other bit of advice I would say is um, to... Yeah, I think continue that sort of self-reflective mindset and really think of what you want and need in a program. And when you're, if you're in a position where you have options, um, think about, you know, what type of support you think you'll need during your MD, PhD process, what um, locations you think you'd be comfortable living in for eight years. That's, I know, like a really hard question, um, but like really important to think about. Um other like considerations of like you know program size like what sort of like cohort do you see yourself like being comfortable with and being supported by um things like that I think really um it can be overwhelming when you have you know choices and thinking about how awesome all your programs that you got into are which I'm sure they're amazing um but yeah thinking about your personal needs and like who you are as a person and um which environment environment will help you grow the most I think um that is, you know, gets, was what I needed to hear when I was like making choices at this stage in the process. Thanks. Gina, I think you talked about this a little bit, 
Um, but what factors do you think were most important to you and what factors do you think are most important to anyone when they're trying to decide um, which program to choose? Yeah, so um, yeah, I mentioned a few. Um, like I said, location I think is important. Like if you um, want to be in a big city um, or if you don't want to be in a big city because that's like expensive and overwhelming or if you you know want to be close to family, um, those considerations I think are not trivial when you're going to be in a place for eight years. Um, I think looking at breadth of research, um, I think making sure that you're not you know, there might be one PI that you really love at one school, but you want to go to a school where you have at least, I would say, five of those people because you're going to need people to be on your committee, people who are going to mentor and support you through the process. And what you want to do now might not be what you end up doing for your PhD. So um, research breadth is really important. Um, and then um, just kind of the program style, I think, when you're looking at especially the like MSTP programs. Um, I found that some programs were very like hands-on and the administration was very involved and, you know, did a lot of programming for students um, versus other programs were more hands-off and students really like ran the show. And I think both are really great and can like be better fits for different people. So again, like thinking about your needs and, and what you, what environment you would do best in. Um, those are, I think, the three biggest considerations when it came down to decision time for me. Yeah, I think Gina covered them all. I have nothing better to say, but just to reiterate this number one, yeah, I, my biggest priority was location, right? We're like we're here for eight years. That's equivalent to about two undergrad degrees, I think, right? So when you think about it from that perspective, you're doing an undergrad like twice within the same city. And so you want to make sure, and you know, location, for example, depends on, oh, are you more of a, once again, like a city person, a rural person, a suburban person? Do you want to be close to family? All that kind of stuff is very, very important. Um, secondly, for me, I think it actually did go hand in hand in my priorities. But the second one for me was the research. Uh, like, you know, are they the, like, the the top best in this or top best in this? Because I told myself that when I was um, when I was if I were to get an MD PhD education, um, I would challenge myself further. I don't want to do the same routine. I mean, I, I could do that, and I'm sure I would do decently okay. But at the same time, I want to challenge myself. This is a time where we have to further like squeeze out that discomfort and make ourselves, you know, make ourselves grow um, in an environment that can really support what we want to do and not so much as what the PI just wants to solely on, on their own, right? Like, for example, there are a lot of PIs um, who just, they have like one hypothesis and uh, because they, they're so stuck on that one hypothesis that um, they keep doing an experiment over and over again, different time points, different doses. And then, you know, this, the, the person, the student is just doing it over and over and over again, right? Like that's a, that's a very, very um, common trait that I've seen. And I want to make sure that I, I want to be in a research area where they really care about our personal progress as well. So I think for me, those two factors were actually tied for first place. And um, so far, I think I've made a decent choice. So. <laughs> We actually have a lot more questions. So um, we're a little bit more than halfway done. So I just wanted to remind everyone here that the session is recorded um, and that the team of co-moderators is just gathering all these questions um, and I'm pulling those questions to answer. Um, and then you will have access to the FAQ document produced by the MD-PhD co-director panelists and that will be provided at a separate link. Um, and then with that, I'm just gonna get back to a couple more questions. So. How did you decide on your program if you had multiple wait lists or multiple acceptances? Um, and do you wish that you had considered other factors that you haven't talked about already? Um, yeah, so I think um, I also didn't mention this, but obviously, like, um, like when you go to like either your revisit or if you have like virtual events with students, like getting a feel for like the student population is also really important. Um, I think that's kind of like the baseline is like make sure that there are happy students and people are like having a good time wherever you go. Um, that is like, I think the most important thing. Um, so yeah, I think that is 
another thing you should consider. Um, yeah, make sure students are happy and feel supported um, and that you like jive well with the people who you're meeting, that they they are like the kind of people you would you would like to be friends with and like hang out with for the next eight years, because you will. Um, I think um, that's another consideration um, you want to think about. Um, and I don't know if there's anything like in retrospect, because I, yeah, I'm happy with my decision, so I probably wouldn't change anything. Um, yeah, just keeping like a big picture in mind and not letting like one flashy thing, like a, like a cool professor or like a really like exciting, like thing about the program, like kind of take your, your eyes away from like the bigger picture. Cause I think that is what's most important is like a holistic view of where you're going to be the happiest. Yeah, I also had mixed um, feeling, feelings about this one as well. Like, for example, I know I wanted to move to New City, um, city, not so much a suburban area. I, I, I'm a very big city kind of guy. Uh, but at the same time, I also wanted to be close by family because I have two younger sisters and I want to make sure that they're OK. So I had to kind of compromise with myself. Uh, so th those are some, some of my very first two factors. Uh, third was that I actually chose um, to go further up north in Montreal and Quebec because where, you know, maybe about 70 percent of our entire population are, are francophone um and i only know um you know within canada I only, I only know english like very very well so once again i had to challenge myself i mean intentionally on purpose uh to learn french so i do three hour sessions every week doing clinical french trying to interview skills in french because it, it, the patients here like it, i'm sure in the states they have the same thing in, in the medical school cur curriculum where you do like this like longitudinal family medicine experience where you shadow family medicine physician and so a big portion of our patients are francophone and if you don't speak french if you don't interview them in french they completely shun you and so i for me chose to challenge myself in that way because i love learning new languages anyway so instead of duolingo why not move to quebec that <laughs> was basically my rationale um so yeah you know, that was my one of my biggest uh, factors can you guys describe your what your timeline looked like from the spring until you know April thirtieth when you use the AMCAS tool to signal where you're going, um, and then maybe what it looked like a little bit before then too when the interviews ended, and then up until second look. I can start again. Um, I think things are a little different now because I think most. It sounds like most places are having like real revisits. Ours were still like, there was some virtual component and there was like some COVID coming back. So it was like, most of them were like, I don't know, not normal, I would say. Um, but yeah, I would say um, I had some acceptances like coming in up until I think the first week of March. And that's when I heard back from everywhere. Um, and um, sort of along the way, if there was school that was interested and I was like taking my name off the wait list, if it, like I knew I wasn't gonna go there, um, which I think is important to make sure you're like leaving, making spots for other people who um, are waiting responses. Um, and then um, from there, I ended up going to um, like three revisit weekends um, that were, um, there were, yeah, those were all in person, um, but some had like virtual components as well. Um, and those, that was kind of March and early April. And then, yeah, made a decision late April, I think, because they, yeah, the, I think like last week of April is when you have to decide. Um, so, yeah, and, and I hung on to like, I think one wait list. I was waiting to see if I could get off of it, but um, that didn't end up working out for me so um yeah that's how it went um yeah and it just varies a lot person to person I think but that's an example of how it can go <laughs> yeah I think I had um high stress levels right throughout I, I mean I think it started from like January up to like late April actually today was a day uh, exactly a year ago was when I when I got my Mikhail Septon's here. Um, I was actually at a rock concert and then I got a notification on my email and, and the email said, oh, your portal status has changed. Please. It's like, why don't you just tell me on the actual email? Like, why not? Right. But so I checked and then I got in all that kind of stuff. So it was very reminiscent. But um, yeah, during like February, March, April, I was also because I was also an international applicant. I was doing credit checks. 
Uh, I remember I was I was apply, I was like looking to apply for F1 visas, all that kind of stuff, and seeing. And for me, the biggest hurdle when it came to um, having some some options in terms of where I could um, go to uh, was, hey, like how does how does it work later on when, when I match for residency? Um, uh, you know, in Canada or in the U.S., like how does that work in terms of IMG status? So I was busy looking more into that on top of the costs, on top of a lot of things, because as you may know, one Canadian dollar is like probably 10,000, you know, no, sorry, one USD, one US dollar is probably like 10,000 Canadian dollars, you know, the whole transition from like moving to Canada and the US was something that I, I was like stressing out over for a good two months. Um, because, they, you know, um, it, some of the research programs that I was interested in was, we're all mostly in the States. Um, and it was, it was just a matter of, should I jump off the boat and see where that takes me? Uh, moving to a whole new country altogether, even though we're we're just down south. Um, so, in terms of the applicant side, while I was waiting, yes, it was very very stressful in the waiting time, waiting waiting the waiting on um, being on the wait list as well. But at the same time, just moving to a whole new place to a whole new country was something that I was stressing out the most over. But obviously, yeah. having multiple <laughs> sentences was uh, it's a, it's a not a bad problem to have. Yeah, right. Yeah, it sounds like you made a really big move and a big transition, and that is very cool. I'm glad you're able to share that with us. Um, I guess so. A lot of your second looks or your interviews may have been virtual. So, uh, what questions did you ask, um, and what helped you get a sense of the program and how you would fit in? When it comes to actually, um, not too sure about Eugenia, but for the interviews, they were all virtual, but the second looks uh, were all in person and I decided to attend them. Um, and so during those times, especially in person ones, um, you know, I, I would always ask the students because the students are the ones that are receiving whatever I'll be receiving the following year. And especially when the staff aren't around. And for me, when I when it comes to asking questions, I'm very, very direct. I'm like, hey, I, you know, um, you know, I. It's a if if the person was was just incoming first year and I was about to go in, um, I'd ask them, hey, you know, how's the transition been? Like, how has the staff been treating you? And it's completely fine because you know X, Y, and Z. I'm still only an applicant here, and so reassuring them and just uh, and asking those kind of questions was something that really helped me out in terms of understanding where the, the actual like truth of things. Obviously, even though a lot of schools are very transparent with a lot of things, right? But because of the fact that we're here for eight years, right? And we can't take back things ourselves. Um, I did try to force myself to be a bit more direct in terms of my questions that way. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, similarly, I um, interviews were all virtual and then like, I, I had some in-person second looks. Um, and I think my strategy was like a, a little less direct than Jay. I kind of like, just wanted to get to know the students and like um especially like if someone had similar interests to me like just kind of like have like a genuine conversation with them and kind of like through that get a sense of how they were doing um and like a mix of that and some direct questions I guess but like I think especially um like you said when um faculty aren't around um just really like getting to know students because I think if if they're like unhappy or if something like isn't jiving well for them like I think that will come out through like a very honest conversation about their experiences um so I would you know just really get to know get to talk to as many people as you can um maybe talk to um I always like had this issue where I was like oh the people who are coming to like panels or like um hopping on the zoom calls are like the people who really like the program and maybe there's people who don't like the program who are just like not on those calls um so like if you're in person that's a really great opportunity to like you know just find like random people and really ask like a lot of people how their experiences are so you can really kind of get a real feel for like what it's like at that school so um yeah that would be my strategy talk to as many people as you can and just kind of um yeah make sure they're doing okay <laughs> I guess maybe for one final question, um, how long should you expect to wait on the wait list? Um, and when should you consider making your final decision?
Gina, do you remember when, when the Choose Your Medical School like tool thing came out? Was it was it March? Like I think March? it's like um yeah, you can start filling out in March maybe. I mean the applicants probably know better than me, but I think like April fifteenth <laughs> you have to like narrow it down to three schools and then like I think the thirtieth of April or like um like the first of May, maybe I think depending on like how the weeks end up um is when you have to like decide on one school um so I think those are both times where you see a lot of like go you tend to see more waitlist movement as people like drop their waitlist or their schools um and yeah I would say it's a little tricky to predict I don't know if I have like super good advice since I like didn't end up going to a waitlist school um but I would say like maybe like a week after that um, April 30th deadline is like when the majority of the movement has happened and like a lot of those like secondary offers have been made. Um, that would be my estimate. Um, not to say that things can't happen after that as things definitely do and things happen before that too. Um, but that would be my my rule of thumb. And again, like getting in contact with like the admissions people saying like, hey, are there still spots available? Like how much longer um, can I wait? Um, I think, yeah, it's a little hard to say like a hard and fast rule because wait lists are very unpredictable. Yeah, I was playing two different games with the Canadian deadlines, also the American deadlines and they have their whole separate other process. So I was kind of like, Okay, so which one should I commit to? So eventually when McGill came out, I had a, McGill was, was one of my top choices anyway. So I was a bit more relieved in terms of taking my wait list, uh, uh, taking my name off the wait list for some schools that I know I wouldn't go anyway uh, in the end. And I, because I, you know, you know, the whole rule where you, know, you want to give, if you drop your name off the wait list and other people who maybe want, are more interested, make it that position instead. So I want to do that. That's what I did. Uh, that's what I did mostly in late March, and then um, in April, around early to mid April, was when I, I I made it come down to about three different schools. I called. I remember I was like calling them ex excessively, like a very annoying applicant back then. Hey, what's the culture like? Hey, do you mind if I come by and like drop by, like see what the, the vibe or like, the school is kind of like, the culture? Um, and so after kind of grinding that out it was around like maybe april like 8th or 7th i want to say because that's my sister's birthday is when i decided to take my name off the wait list for like basically everywhere except the place i want to go to so yeah thank you guys so much for joining our q a session today um with our current students about choosing a program i want to especially thank our panelists for their time and the participants who made the session so interactive, um, and so many people, including the APSA Diversity Ad Hoc, PR Partnerships Committee, and APSA leadership, that not only put these sessions together, but work to make sure the UIM applicants receive word of it as well. Our next interactive session is scheduled for April 6th, uh, where we will be discussing applications about submitting and finalizing primaries, which is really exciting. A new application season is beginning. So please stay tuned via social media and look out for further emails to register for our upcoming events. Again, thank you everybody who participated, who joined, um, and thank you to our panelists. Again, you guys are amazing.